any of these foundations, you will get a, a whiff of, of how much fresh air is being blown into um, uh, this world by people from the outside. So in answer to your question, what I um, look for is any kind of leadership which represents a kind of cross-pollination of private and public sector, of um, people from the world of business, people from traditional nonprofit world. When you get that kind of hybrid of those two perspectives, I think anything is possible. Um, you know, to go back to my KIPP example, the KIPP Academy was founded by two teachers who came out of Teach for America. Teach for America is a nonprofit initiative that was developed to augment the school system, right? It's a hybrid. And what happened with that hybrid? Well, a generation after Teach for America was founded, two, people, two guys graduated from there and said, let's start a chain of charter schools, incorporating some of our fresh ideas from the outside. And that's, that kind of cross-pollination is, um, is, uh, is such a powerful thing. And that's, that really is really what gets me excited. Um, I lived in New York for about 10 years in the 80s and 90s, and a lot of people there attribute uh, New York's comeback to Giuliani and Bratton's uh, increased police presence and uh, uh, advocating the broken window of the theory of policing, arresting people for small crimes like loitering and uh, pandering and uh, drug possession. And uh, to the extent that was effective, uh, it made the city a lot safer, particularly for the poor people that were the primary victims of crime. Uh, so my question is, do you uh, believe in the effectiveness of that theory and if so, how do you reconcile that with your advocacy of reduced sentences for drug possession, for example? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think that many, many, many things went into the decline in crime in New York City. Um, and uh, chief uh, uh, among those things was um, uh, a willingness on the part of the police to believe that their actions could make a difference. That is to say... Policing was not reactive. It could be proactive. Um, they could set standards in public spaces for behavior. Um, I don't find that inconsistent with, um, uh, with the notion that it is wise to strike a more um, practical balance between uh, punitive drug laws and, um, and, um, uh, uh, and sort of compassion in that area. Um, I think that it, it's just part of... Um, uh, I, I think they could be consistent. What, what, what binds those is a notion that police work ought to be intelligent. It should be guided by clear strategic goals. Um, it should be informed by the notion that they can make a difference. And if you look at all the things that the police have done subsequently in New York to bring crime rate down even further, and it continues to fall, um, they have moved well beyond that initial strategy of broken windows and have gone to um, really attempting to understand the intricate dynamics of crimes in individual neighborhoods. And it's an extraordinarily impressive demonstration of, of how um, the, the public sector can use its resources wisely and effectively. That being said, it should also be pointed out that the work that the police did was only one part of a huge effort by many different organizations in that city to address some of the underlying social problems um, of, of the community. Um, every bit as important were the groups that took over management of the parks and cleaned the parks up and made them, you know, livable public spaces again. The incredible numbers of religious groups who worked in, to develop affordable housing in the South Bronx. The, I can go on and on and on. The school, the educational work that I've been talking about with KIPP, these are all, everybody climbed on board after that initial success that the police had with crime. And that's what's made that a real sustainable movement in New York. It's very important when you listen, when Rudy Giuliani goes around the country talking about his record in the city, it's very important to understand that he was one of a thousand people who worked to bring down the crime rate. Um, in New York. He would like to pretend that he was one of one. Um, as I said to the, I talked to a reporter from the Star Tribune, I said, always remember what Johnny Unitas said. The quarterbacks get too much credit when their teams win and too much blame when they lose. Right? When Giuliani speaks, remember that.
Yes. Um, what what uh, brand is your air conditioner? <laughs> 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 I was wondering, listening to your uh, your analogies or anecdotes about the Jews and the Italians in New York in the early 1900s vis-à-vis the Mexicans in, in uh, 1925, etc., and given the history of our country around race and color, um, uh, what role does a positive regard play um, in creating... Uh, life enhancing opportunities for people um, uh, in initiating difficult efforts on their behalf <clears throat> and how do you change a uh, community or society to upgrade positive regard of historically downgraded people yeah Well, that is on the long list of difficult questions. (laughs) We've ended on the most difficult. Um, And the short answer is, I don't know. Um, But I share your belief that that's one we've got to crack um, uh, before we can um, really solve uh, this puzzle. Um, You know, uh, David Lebedoff mentioned that I'm writing a new book, and one of the things that I'm doing this book is I am looking at um, the kind of historical legacies that different cultures have. Uh, Does it matter what your uh, great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents did for a living, or where they lived, or the circumstances under which they worked? And the answer is it does, in ways that are very, very um, surprising and in some ways disturbing. We really are profoundly, in ways we choose to ignore, creatures of our history, family history, our cultural history are. Um, and unless we appreciate that fact and deal with the, those legacies, whether they are positive or negative, I don't know whether we're ever going to fully wrap our minds around the, the problems that um, bedevil us. And also I think that unless you understand where you come from, you can't change the future. Um, you have to understand the kind of hand you've been dealt and then take appropriate steps. Let me give you, oh, and this is a sort of Two minutes, two minutes on this one story. I went out to Berkeley. I'm obsessed with math for complicated reasons in this book. I went out to Berkeley, and they had a problem in the 1970s that qualified African-American students were coming into Berkeley with great test scores, and they were flunking out of freshman calculus, and they didn't understand why. And they were looking at the other kids in freshman calculus, particularly the Asian kids, and those kids were acing it. And they were, the question was, what's going on here? Right? They're, these black kids have great math scores coming into the school, but they're failing. And they looked very closely, and the first round was maybe they can't do math. And then there was one guy, what do you want to call? He said, no, he wouldn't refuse to accept that. He began to interview all the kids. And what he discovered was that the Asian kids, after math class was over in the evenings, would get together in a group and study, compare notes, help each other out. Why did they do that? Because that was a powerful part of their uh, cultural vocabulary. It's the way they operate. It's the way they operated when they were in high school. It's what, they were, what their culture taught them. The African-American kids, by contrast, came, by and large came from very disadvantaged communities. And the only way that they could make it and distinguish themselves as scholars in high school and middle school was if they separated themselves from their peers. They learned independence. And they learned that the route to academic success was to do it yourself and to push away all of the influences on the group influences that would drag you down. And what he realized was you can't do freshman calculus by yourself. The very thing that got you into Berkeley was harming you once you were there. So that teacher did a very simple thing, which is he got all the African-American students together and anyone else who wanted to join and said, we're going to have our own group. We're going to meet every night, 8 o'clock. We're going to do math until we're exhausted. We're going to do exactly what the other kids are doing. And you know what happens when they did that? Their, their grades were ended up being roughly the same as the grades of the Asian students. Now, that is a case where when you understand the cultural hand that you've been dealt, you can do something about it. Right? You, un, you, can, you can fix the problem, not by changing who you are, 